Cool. <coughs> All right. Uh, hello and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jonathan Quack. I'm the co-founder of Two Projects, a design studio that focuses on uh, new ideas and technology. I think you might want to talk, speak up. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. That's I th not I a mic. I thought it was a mic. It's for the recording. Okay. That's why I didn't hear the. So, uh, for the past two and a half years, I was the producer of a uh, and head of a content team for a virtual solutions company. And before that, I spent a decade in the CG and games industry uh, as a producer and artist. Oh, great. Thanks. Hello. Hello. Thanks. Uh, so, uh, so, here's a quick overview of my portfolio so far. Uh, I've done a, we've done a mobile VR application here in the top right hand corner, top left hand corner, uh, for Marina Square. You can download this on the App Store and Android Play Store. Uh, it's basically a, a game where you can uh, look around and immerse yourself in a Christmas town. Uh, over there, we have a web VR project which was for Singapore Tourism Board, uh, hotspots of Singapore. We called it. We took 360 photos of Singapore uh, around places in Singapore, and we put it up on the web. Uh, so basically, anybody with a handphone and a browser could could visit this site. Uh, you can explore Singapore in a normal kind of touchscreen mode, or you can go into VR mode and put on your Google Cardboard. Uh, I've done mobile games and uh, PC MMO online games. Okay. Uh, so my share for tonight uh, is about developing content for VR, but more accurately, uh, insights of my personal experience as a game developer working on VR projects uh, for the last couple of years. I hope my experience will prove useful and timely uh, for you, as the major VR players are kind of close to showing their hand. Uh, so before we begin, uh, some pointers to quickly mention. The, the purpose of my talk is not really to you know, give you a guide on how to develop VR content. Uh, it's really more of a case study share and general observation. So the projects that I've worked on were largely client uh, business to business projects. So they were produced with very specific needs and uh, limitations. So with that in mind, let's begin. Okay. Uh, so the company I work for has been in VR for a long time, uh, I think close to 15 years. Uh, so since HMD tech wasn't mature yet, uh, this is VR, all right, in the form of uh, cave systems. So this cave system is essentially uh, four screens, uh, front, bottom, left, and right, uh, with four pro short throw projectors mounted on top. So one projector per side, and uh, this kind of synced up to, a, to four workstations over here, as you can see, uh, one computer per projector. So they are synced together to give you a kind of semi-immersive, you know, 180, 360, how, however you call it, uh, kind of virtual environment. Uh, and within the space, we have Vicon trackers, which track your movement um, by looking at photoreflective balls mounted to your glasses. And also, they will track any kind of photoreflective balls mounted onto, say, a Xbox controller, for example, or any kind of device, really. Uh, it could be a sword, it could be a gun, right? Uh, so they track your 3D movement and offset the camera or whatever it is you have in the uh, content. Uh, yeah. So with this sort of setup, people can uh, enter the virtual environment uh, either by themselves or in, in large groups, uh, as you can see, like so. You, the spectators can stand behind and watch what's going on, what's you know the activity that's going on inside, or they can watch it via a secondary output. Uh, we can output another video out to a separate screen uh, in another remote location. Okay, right, and let's have a look at a couple of applications that we worked on. This application is sorry, let me see if I can. Right, so this application is a training simulation that we created. Uh, to train technicians uh, that work within this sort of environment. Um, it teaches them to refer to their work orders, safety regulations, and to maneuver within that uh, space. And within this virtual space, we can pose certain scenarios to them uh, in a safe environment. Okay, so as you can see, with this tracking technology, uh, they, they look through the work orders, they can even bend down, move around the space, Okay, as though they were actually there. Okay, uh, over here 
it's a similar simulation that we did, and this was for a substation training. So technicians can go in and work with the equipment. Um, we also had, we could also uh, role play a supervisor trainee simulation where a trainer could be sitting outside this, uh, this environment and watch what he's doing and send him commands uh, on what to do. So other applications that we did for these VR environments um, are in the aerospace and maritime industries. Uh, as you can see, we created uh, airport environments and uh, marine offshore environments. And law enforcement was one of our areas. This was actually a project that we did with students. And they designed a CSI murder mystery simulation for this VR environment. As you can see, you can step inside the environment. Uh, you could look under the sofa uh, for clues. Uh, you can manipulate objects within the scene using the Xbox controller. Look for clues, uh, hunt for the murderer. So there's a bit of story, story narrative in this. Uh, so we, we did notice at this point when we did this project that uh, the police in, in other countries were actually using 3D scanning technology to record uh, actual crime scenes. They scan everything on the spot and this can be recreated and put into these VR environments for, you know, maybe they could revisit the crime scene at a later date or maybe train other detectives and police officers. Uh, we also worked on architectural and interior design projects. So 3D environment uh, was created. You could go inside here, you could move the furniture around and uh, test your new layouts, you know, uh, bring your clients in, show them what the design is going to be like. Of course, uh, creating content for VR is really not unlike creating content for 3D games, right? You use, you build the same scene with the same considerations, you use power of two textures, you use optimized polygons, all the same principles. Uh, this particular scene was created for a case system, but was ported to the mobile VR platform in only a matter of days. It was also uh, ported to a HMD, no optimization, uh, no optimization required, of course, because it's basically using the same computer. Uh, just some changes to the code and to the interaction. Of course, uh, it's not just a matter of changing code and interaction. We know that this is true because uh, take a look at this sample workflow, right? Uh, this was for a particular project that we did. It took one month to do, okay? Uh, it started off with a design phase. We storyboarded with the client. We took about maybe a day or two to work out what exactly the flow will be. Then once that was determined, we entered our production phase. So with about four artists, we created all the arts, art assets necessary for the project. After the art assets were done, uh, we handed it off to our developers, our coders, to work on for another two weeks. And then, of course, during these two weeks, uh, we had several review milestones, like a L prototype, alpha, beta stage. Then finally, we, we finished and we delivered. So uh, if you were to create a, if you had an existing project, which you wanted to port to VR, uh, this phase would not be repeated, of course. Your assets are all there, right? But uh, you'd have to redo, you probably have to redo your development and testing and your design phase all over again. So it's not such a straightforward, uh, you know, transference to VR. Uh, so with that in mind, we, let's talk about the head-mounted displays, uh, which are on the ridge right now. So it consists of a powerful workstation, just like the cave systems, and a HMD device such as the Oculus Rift. Uh, so it's in this kind of scenario, you can see uh, this person here, he's wearing the, she's wearing the HMD, she's using a leap motion that's mounted in front of the HMD to detect her hand movements. Uh, so in this, kind of inter in this kind of setup, it's actually very hard for spectators to join in, to participate, right? Because uh, you need ex extra processing power to actually output the secondary video, uh, which is what we've done over here. Right. Uh, in normal setups, you just have the computer running and your HMD. Uh, so that kind of limits the kind of content you create. It has to be uh, uh, efficient enough for you to run the extra view output uh, in order for spectators to view. It's also a bit hard for spectators to view because once this thing is mounted on your head, movement of the camera is a little rapid, uh, so it's a bit hard for them to see. So uh, the projects that we did were mostly uh, we're mostly porting projects, but I'd like to start with a project that we did uh, with VR in mind. Right, so you can see the hand representation over here. This is being controlled by the leap motion. 
Uh, that's my colleague moving up there in front of the screen. So he's typing in his name. Uh, this project was for uh, conceptualizing digital life in the future. So what would uh, the future be like when you do your online shopping and your Facebook checking of messages you know, within a digital environment, uh, within this virtual space? So we found that uh, the, the leak motion detection was quite sufficient uh, for you to actually tap individual keys on the keyboard. Uh, of course, but there were some kind of uh, limitations. It, it did get a little tiring after a while when you hold your hand in front of your face like this. It's, it's a little unnatural, right? So uh, you can also see that we're just playing around with some ideas. We're uh, uh, imagining a shopping scenario where you're checking your messages and all of a sudden you're being prompted with a special offer from the ice cream product. And then you enter a game uh, supplied by the ice cream <laughs> supplier. And in this game, all you have to do is kind of rotate your head around and stare at the ice cream for a couple of seconds to collect it. So, like, like really stare at it, right? Like you really want it. Uh, Over here, we have um, our Tree One Tree Christmas project, which we did for the cave system. So this particular project was quite fun. We had people sit on a little mat inside, and we took them through a winter wonderland. We gave them a little wand uh, that looked like the digital wand that's inside the game, and it had tracker balls on it. So if you wave the wand, you control the wand inside the game. So the objective of this game was to uh, collect as many presents as possible while flying through uh, the winter wonderland. Let me see if I can fast forward this. Okay. So that's our participant waving the wand. And off they go. So presents will appear along the ride, and sometimes you, you even have to kind of stand up and reach to the far corner to get a present. So this project was ported to a HMD. And what we had to do was we, we, you know, we didn't have the wand anymore. So for this, we used the leap motion again. So you now use your hands to collect the presents. Um, but of course, in this case, we actually had to move the presents closer to the front of the user. So they kind of concentrated along the path for them to collect. Now, uh, this was fine, but we actually found that the, the final experience was actually a little bit lacking. You know, we designed this game for the cave system, for people to kind of move around and grab stuff. Once we brought it to the HMD, it felt a little different. Why? Because you were actually always looking forward. And then your control is limited to just in front of you. So all the presents were kind of collected together. You weren't really looking around and taking full advantage of the 360 space. Uh, so I think this is a point about how when you port your existing product into VR, you may actually lose some of the original VR intent. Okay. So this is a project that we did for Rio Tinto. It's a mining company. Uh, we did a underground mine simulation. We brought uh, technicians down into the, uh, the thousand meters underground, uh, and we posed certain scenarios like a cave-in, uh, you know, collapsing kind of scenario. And uh, in this case, we and then after that we ported it to HMD as well. And in this case, we actually found that it improved the experience because of the insulating nature of a HMD. Once you put it on, you're cut off from the world. Uh, you have no awareness of what's around you. So your, your sense of immersion is kind of augmented, is, is heightened. So being, tr you know, trying to convince you that you're in that environment, facing this sort of dangers was easier. Okay. Uh, so, but virtual reality in reality is really not the happy picture that marketing paints, right? Um, from my experience, it's really quite an involved process. There is a lot of things involved. There's infrastructure, right? As you can see, uh, the cave systems that we set up, or possibly in the future when Oculus Rift comes up and they have their spatial recognition technology, you have to worry about the room that you're going to set up in. So uh, clients are going to have to worry about whether they have enough ceiling space, whether they have enough power supply, whether there's enough clearance for the room to set up that sort of thing. Then you're going to have to worry about hardware, what, which HMD to use, uh, whether your, power, your workstation will be powerful enough, software, the kind of SDKs that you need to learn to, in order to implement your content into the HMD, uh, content, of course, and of course, uh, there's also operations. 
What I mean by operations is you need people to set up. You need people to turn on the computer, to run the thing uh, for you to set up. Uh, and in my, my experience, a lot of clients don't have this capability. Uh, they, they have the money, they have the infrastructure, but they need help. They need training for people to run this equipment on a day-to-day -day basis and troubleshoot when necessary. So, uh, moving on, we finally come to the most accessible form of VR, which is uh, mobile VR. Uh, so in mobile VR, you have, you, you know, uh, the infrastructure's problem is, is, is gone, right? Uh, you, you don't have to worry about that. Everybody has the base hardware. You have a handphone, you can, you can do this. All you need is your handphone and a set of lenses, something like this, or perhaps something even simpler. Ah. Like this. So this is pretty much all you're gonna need. Hook this up onto your handphone and you're ready to go. So this is by far the most accessible option. Sorry. Okay, uh, so one of the projects that we did was the Marina Square VR Xmas project. Uh, you can download this on the App Store as well. Uh, we did this for a Christmas event that he had. Okay, uh, sorry. So, okay, moving along. So just a quick look at, at this application. Okay, so you're in Christmas Town, you can rotate around to, to enjoy the view, enjoy the music, enjoy all the animations inside. You could also activate a uh, mini game by staring at that, that speech balloon over there, and then you have to look for the reindeer that's hidden around the village. So you have to look 360, look up and down, and hunt for the reindeer. You collect, you find all eight reindeers, you save Christmas, Santa can take off. Something like that. So you look a little bit to the side, and that's one. Okay. Uh, over here was a project that we did for a pest extermination company. Uh, same strategy, we actually have two modes, a normal mode where you could play without VR, and then when you're ready, you're comfortable with the controls, you can enter a VR mode and put it on. So uh, you can uh, learn about you know, what's, what's so dangerous about rats, and then you can place, uh, play a little kind of power defense-like game over there. Okay, just quick video. Yeah. So this was this is the uh, normal mode, right? So you can see that UI fills up the whole screen. Once we ported this to VR, we had to kind of change this whole setup and uh, make it a little bit more 3D. You look around to, to read all the UI. And we also made the gameplay sim simpler for the VR mode. So um, instead of manually placing these uh, devices, you had to just stare at predetermined placements. Right, so uh, to summarize, okay. uh, VR I think has uh, real potential in education, serious gaming and training simulations. Uh, I think the insulation lens focus, the immersion augments your retention ability. Um, you have options for teacher-student kind of co-op play. Um, corporations and institutions all have the means for VR infrastructure, so that's not an issue. Okay, uh, I think VR is actually a little bit intimidating. It's, it's not really for everyone. Um, for all the kind of projects that we did, we sometimes encountered problems where we, we actually couldn't convince people to try it out. They, they just, you know, very politely opted out of it. So that was a bit of a bummer. Um, but VR's best accessory, in, in my own opinion, is a comfortable chair in a private locked room. Okay, uh, this is the best kind of setup. I'm not certain you're allowed to stream that kind of content. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but still, my point. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I like to... Uh, yes. <laughs> So I'd like you to consider, you know, having VR really as an opt-in option. You know, uh, instead of being the only option, you know, it really doesn't matter how good your content in is if if they don't try it. Uh, I think VR needs a new design paradigm. Uh, in VR, you know, you have to ask yourself: Is it even necessary for your project? There were times where you know our clients said we want VR, but you know, once we scoped out their requirement, it's not really necessary. 
So it needs to be, or, or it's not, or otherwise it's not worth the effort. Um, you have to understand that the VR experience is sort of like a ghost experience where you have to design controls for somebody who cannot even see their, their own bodies, right? I think that uh, VR is also still like, very fragmented and quite delayed. Um, so it makes it very hard for you to study how people use this application. You know, when mobile phones and tap swipe controls came out, you know, you had a bit of time to study people. Um, but VR is really not there in the market yet. Um, uh, I think HMDs, uh, honestly speaking, probably won't be here until much later in the year. Um, multiple devices, multiple SDKs will also make it very difficult for developers um, to reach a wider market. So my advice, I think, would be you know, to take this time to really build a foundation. Um, you, know, you should try testing the market by working on smaller B2B projects. Uh, you should you know, develop your foundation in making games first before trying VR. Um, and of course, the Western and China markets are pretty active now. Um, the VR is not the only expanding tech that you can look into. There's lots of other options like augmented reality, all very interesting uh, stuff to try out. And of course, take this time to develop a good business model. Uh, this will be essential. And uh, with that, I, I thank you. I thank you. I thank the organizers for you know, allowing me this privilege. Uh, we are working on a few more talks, and if you're interested in those, uh, you can check for updates on our website. And that's all. Thank you. So, in terms of make your own VR stuff, we have. So the question is, uh, what's my recommendation for implementing this technology into the real estate uh, industry? So. Uh, as, as you saw earlier, there were a couple of examples where we created full 3D environments uh, for interior design and architectural visualization. But of course, I think for real estate, it's a bit different. You, you don't want to spend that kind of effort to show what the current state of your apartment is. Um, I think that the best way to approach real estate would be uh, really 360 photography. Uh, let me just scroll down to it. So we know that it's uh, not PowerPoint, fucking up presentations in 2000. Just real quick. I've got a nice little slide for show you. Right, uh, so we know that 360 cameras are gaining popularity these days. Uh, we, have, we have Nokia with the Ozo. We have Facebook recently with the Surround 360. Uh, we have various other options from Samsung, from Ricoh Theta, and Kodak, Nikon. Everybody's getting into this. Uh, I don't recommend GoPro. This, this is a monster to use. I, imagine having six cameras, right, and one of them decided to run out of battery. Uh, so, but the rest of these are kind of integrated. So I think these are very good options for real estate. You take a picture and then uh, you kind of load it up to a website where people can just visit and have a quick look around. They may not be able to interact with the furniture, but I don't think that that's really a requirement. Uh, all you have to do is just see the different rooms, right? You can even perhaps do time-lapse videos. You can watch the, you know, the path of the sunlight move through your spaces and put that on the internet as well. That's possible. Yeah, so just one question is uh, you mentioned about the starting from the experimentation from the B2B model. Yes. Very good learn good training, but what could be the trigger to transform the B2B to B2C? That is the moment I'm just wondering. The big question. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> still working on that one. Yeah, still working on that one really. Uh you know, because uh, the projects that we did were mostly, we had very spe specific set of requirements, right, and limitations, usually with a, um, 
you know, target audience and so on and so forth. I, I do think that some of the things that you learn from these projects will flow over. For example, if you consider uh, the way people use this application uh, in small groups, because ultimately whatever application you create has to hit a target audience of a certain nature. It, it could be kids, it could be elderly people, it could be adults, right? So um, I think that certain B2B projects are, allow you some room to learn from that experience. Uh, I, I, I think that maybe studying games or mobile applications would fill up the rest of the gap. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Okay, last question. Yes. Can you uh, reveal your price or price range for <laughs> Sorry, price range for? Ah, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I have to apologize because that that sort of thing was handled by my sales team and my business development team. So I, I'm really sorry. Uh, but allow me to try and answer that question. Um, for the Marina Square project, we took a month to deliver the project. Uh, not by design. They already signed the deal when they called me into the room. So it was a month. So a month it had to be. Um, so for, as I showed you earlier in uh, our sample workflow, that workflow was actually for the Marina Square project. Um, so in terms of costs, we start off by calculating our man hours, right? Our man days required to uh, complete the project. And then you add the extra, extra, extra for profit. So let me try and share with you uh, the baseline. Right, so usually the extra, extra, extra is <laughs> yeah, but he said so. Um, so this design phase here would take about a day or two. So you count one to two man days, right? Um, because there was a, it was time sensitive, so our clients didn't dance around with us on the design. Once we satisfied them, they signed off, and we were good to go. Uh, the art production stage really did take two weeks. We had about four artists working for two weeks. That's ten man days times four, right? Forty man days. Then for the development phase, we actually only had one developer, one coder to work on the project, um, to put all the art assets together um, and to test it and send it up. So again, two weeks, 10 man days, one developer. So, right. so you kind of add it up. And then for every man day, you give it a little cost. Maybe it's $250, maybe it's $400, dollars etc. Right. So that's, that's your baseline there. Um, then 30%. And what what have you? It, yeah. Sadly, this does not mean you you make thirty percent in this project. It just means thirty percent covers your risk. Mm. Hopefully, praise God, you will make more than that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do we have time yeah. for one, one more? Question. Yeah. I'm not taking the goggles, but okay. So, um, was that part of the decision why you chose look as your main form of interaction? Does this make any sort of hand? Thank you. Yes. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. So you're, you're asking uh, whether this affected our decision to make the application a single point view to look 360. Actually, uh, not really. Uh, the, the decision to do that was actually because we knew that this was going out to the general public. We knew that uh, you know people of all ages were going to get exposed to this. People like kids and old people were going to get exposed to this. And we've, we've often found that motion inside 360 applications were very... Uh, disorienting. Okay, so uh, it was actually safer. It was a safety decision. We we place them in a single spot, and then you control the speed, you control the movement, how fast you move. And so, uh, so that's it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your questions.